Hi everybody, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Dr Susan Watkins. I'm Director of the Centre for Culture and the Arts at Leeds Beckett University. I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth in our series of Leeds Cultural Conversations. The Centre has organised this series in partnership with Leeds City Council and it's also supported by the publisher Palgrave Macmillan. We're working closely with Palgrave on their Campaign for the Humanities. <coughs> For more information about the other forthcoming talks in the series, please visit our website. And just to let you know that the talks are being filmed, and there will also be plenty of time for questions afterwards. <coughs> Today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr Heather Shaw. Heather is a specialist historian of crime, and her first book, Artful Dodgers, Youth and Crime in Early 19th Century London, focused on juvenile crime in the early 19th century metropolis. Heather's most recent book, which was published in 2015, is London's Criminal Underworlds, circa 1720 to 1930, a social and cultural history. The book explores changing ideas about the criminal underworld from the early 18th until the early 20th century, and it builds on the research she has previously done into individual criminals and organised crime gangs providing a framework to explore contemporary understandings of habitual and serious criminality. Heather is also the co-leader, along with Dr Helen Johnston of Hull University, of the Our Criminal Past Research Network of UK-based stakeholders who are working academically and or professionally in the field of the criminal, legal and penal history of Britain. She's currently working on a jointly written book based on the research for her most recent project, with Barry Godfrey of Liverpool University and Pam Cox of Essex University, called Aftercare, Young Criminal Lives, Life Courses and Life Chances After 1850. So today, Heather will be talking to us on the subject of The Real Fagin, The Life and Crimes of William Sheen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. OK, thank you for coming. Um, OK, so between... 1835 and 1836, William Augustus Miles, who was a close associate of the reformer and the campaigner, Edwin Chadwick, interviewed juvenile offenders in Newgate Prison and on board the Euralis Prison Hulk. And this was moored at Chatham, and they were the uh, in inmates on the Hulk were awaiting transportation to Australia. Now, Miles and his associates interviewed the youths about their families, about their onset into criminality, about their previous offences, and also about their thoughts about the future. Many of the boys described their offending lives in great detail. So they talked about <coughs> the value of the goods that they stole, for example. Uh, they also talked about rich parts of town provided the richest pickings. And they also told about, talked about who they sold their stolen goods to. Uh, for example, a youth named Hewitt described his downfall as follows. We've got this on the slide. So it's slightly awkward turning to the side like this. So, uh, OK, so this is Hewitt in 1835-6. My first ruin was Penny Place. I met, there, I met boys there who induced me to go. Let's go thieving. They were thieves who went out regularly at night. I lodged at Sheen's, the old man. The son lived near and fenced with his father. They were bad people. So fencing was the practice of receiving gold and stolen goods. Later on, in his account, Hewitt comments, Sheen was always teaching boys. He walks about and gets the boys to buzz him, to feed him. And sometimes they do it and flare it, and he sends for gin and treats them. Another youth interviewed by Miles in this period, an 18-year-old female thief called Mary Mouse also told him that she sold things to Sheen. Miles concluded in his book, which was based on the investigations from this period and called Poverty, Mendicity and Crime, he concluded that Sheen was a thorough villain. So I first came across these glimpses of William Sheen in my doctoral thesis on uh, juvenile crime in London in the early 19th century. And uh, as Sue mentioned, the book came out uh, Quite a long time ago now, 1999, I think. And underlying the doctoral research for the book, for the thesis, was a deep desire to know more about London's historical artful dodgers. 
And as the faces developed, I think what I really wanted to, wanted to do was to give the real Artful Dodgers a voice. Who were these children? And it was in my attempts to listen to that voice that I came across the life and crimes of William Sheen. And the similarities between the youth's descriptions of Sheen and Dickens' notorious Fence Fagin were notable. You were going to get a picture of Ron Moody at some point in this paper. <laughs> Is my handkerchief hanging out of my pocket, my dear? I'll try not to do it in my Ron Moody accent, sorry. Is my handkerchief hanging out of my pocket, my dear? Said the Jew, stopping short. Yes, sir, said Oliver. See if you can take it out without my feeling it, as you saw them do when they were, when they were at play this morning. Oliver held up the bottom of the pocket with one hand, as he had seen the Dodger do, and drew the handkerchief lightly out with the other hand. Is it gone? cried the Jew. Here it is, sir, said Oliver, showing it in his hand. This form of trope of the experienced adult teaching young boys the tricks of the trade was, wasn't actually an invention of Dickens, and so-called schools for pickpockets had actually been uh, described in accounts of early modern London in the 16th and the 17th century. However, my curiosity about Sheen was further piqued by Hewitt's description, final part of his description, when he says to Miles, this is the one who cut the child's head off. So this paper is going to be in three parts. Firstly, I'll provide a necessarily abbreviated account of the life of William Sheen, starting with the terrible crime that took place a decade before young Hewitt made his comment, his startling comment, on board the Euryalus. The second part of the paper will outline the parallels between Sheen's criminal life and the contemporary career of young Charles Dickens. And then very briefly, I'll finish with saying a little bit more about how this sort of life history fits into my broader work as a historian of crime. So who was William Sheen? Well, despite being a serial and notorious offender whose activities were frequently reported in the early Victorian press, William Sheen would eventually slip into obscurity in the annals of crime. Nevertheless, he is an identifiable figure whose presence can be tra tra uh, traced through a very wide range of documents. And this is largely due for the uh, event uh, for which he gained his initial infamy. And this took place in late May 1827, when he was tried at the Old Bailey for the murder of Charles William Beadle, his former old child. Now, the murder had apparently taken place in, uh, on Thursday, the 10th of May, at his home in Christopher's Court, which was in Whitechapel. And at the time of the murder, he was aged 26. So I want to start with the murder. Now, it's not, clear, it's not clear whether Sheen was already involved in criminal activities before this murder. I can't find any obvious traces of him before the murder. So it may have been this act and the notoriety that was attached to him and his family as a result of the act that served as the tipping point uh, for the family's uh, life of crime they seem to have sub subsequently adopted. Now, if he had been involved in any petty crimes, they're not, not likely to have been reported in the press, so the petty sessions tend not to be reported uh, very assiduously in this period, so I wouldn't have necessarily picked them up. In the years after the murder, charges of theft, burglary, fencing and brothel keeping were accompanied by a litany of episodes of violence, often alcohol fueled, uh, which, bring, which really did bring the, fa the family into contact with the police. But what I want to do at this point is actually say a little bit more about that sort of tipping point, about the murder that took place in 1827. So the dreadful murder in Whitechapel, as it was called at the time. So Charles William Beadle was the illegitimate son of William Sheen and the woman who became his wife, Lydia. Lydia Beadle. He married Lydia after the boy's birth. And at some point between the boy's birth and his death, 
Lydia had moved to Christopher Court. She's originally from south of the river, so she moved to Whitechapel to Christopher Court and moved in with Sheen. And it was in this house, the house of uh, Sarah and John Pomeroy, where they lodged, where the body of the baby would be found. So it was Sarah Pomeroy who went to the Lambeth Street police officer to report the death of their baby. And uh, police officer Ebenezer Dalton described how he had found the body. So just very quickly, just to uh, sort of locate where the areas I'm talking about, you've, just about, you've got the river here, the Royal Mint, and the uh, Tower of London. And then Rosemary Lane is here. So mo most of these locations are off Rosemary Lane. And Lambeth Street Police Office was just here. So Ebenezer Dalton says, on entering the room, I saw the child's head on the table and a quantity of blood. I searched, and in the corner of, a room, of the room was a bed with the body of the child covered with a counterpane. There was a great quantity of blood on the floor as well as on the table. The head appeared as if it had been cut off with a sharp instrument. I was just about to go and click on there rather than on the other side. This is the uh, contemporary broadside with the uh, illustration, well, the graphic illustration. According to the evidence of Joseph Corduroy, who had been with Sheen at the King of Prussia public house in Blue Anchor Yard, Rosemary Lane, the accused had been drinking heavily most of the afternoon. At 5.30, his wife came for him. According to Corduroy, he was in a good humour. They went directly and I went with them to their house. This was described as a small upstairs room with a bed. Corduroy left at f around 5.45, at which time his boy was in our arms, in his wife's arms, alive and well. So the child was alive, as well, alive and well when Corduroy left. At 7.30, Sarah Pomeroy, the landlady, was called to the room by Lydia, where she found the baby's body. She and the mother immediately went for assistance to Lambeth, police officer, Lambeth Street Police Office, and they brought Dalton back with them. So at the subsequent trial, Sheen's father gave evidence about his son's movement. And he said that he had last seen him at eight o'clock in the evening. He had told his father that he had been fighting some Irishmen and that one of these had been stabbed, which accounted for the amount of blood he was obviously covered in. Together they went to the house of somebody called Joseph Pugh in Carnaby Market near, near uh, Oxford Street. And they went there to borrow some money and some clean clothes and also to get rid of the clasp knife that Sheen said he'd used in his fight with the Irishmen. And he then went on the run. So he travels to Radnorshire in Wales, which I think is modern day Powys. Apologies to anybody from that area who's in here, if I've got that wrong. And the, the family actually had some relatives in Wales, so they were a Welsh family. So a manhunt was raised, and a police officer named Davis actually followed Sheen's trail to Wales where he found Sheen uh, basically hiding in a farmhouse in Radnorshire. According to Davis, Sheen didn't deny culpability for the murder. On the journey back to London, he was described as saying, oh, my poor mother, when she knows I'm taken, it will break her heart. And the case went to trial at the Old Bailey on the 31st of May, 1827. And this is where it gets slightly strange. So it's noted at the, case, at, the, at the trial that the victim, Charles William Beadle, had been born illegitimately. However, in the indictment, and this is the document that actually describes the charge, so it, contain, you know, it dis, dis, contains the details of the accusation. In the indictment, the victim was named as Charles William Sheen. So there was a difference in terms of the two names. So confused matters even more, the coroner's inquest charged Sheen with the murder of Charles William Beadle. So there's significant confusion over the naming of the victim in the legal documents that accompanied the trial. Sheen's counsel, a man called Mr Clarkson, argued that because of this confusion, they needed to produce a new indictment. Now, in the meantime, the court found Sheen not guilty on a legal technicality but they arranged, they adjourned and arranged for a second trial. 
In between the trials, concern was expressed about the adjournment and the possible outcomes, so the Times commented on the general anxiety that Sheen would escape the hands of justice. Now, these worries were not unfounded. You can read that, possibly not. So the next trial took place at a very crowded Old Bailey on the 12th of July. The prosecution had worked hard to present the case against Sheen so as to meet any possible legal objection. However, it had clearly been advised between the previous trial and this one, since after the indictment was read, he submitted a written plea to the court. And this isn't very straightforward in the original language, but I'll read it nonetheless that he had been before indicted, tried and acquitted, as well on that indictment as on the coroner's inquest at the last session held in this place for the murder of the same child as described in the present indictment, and that the same child was as well known by the name and description as contained in that indictment and inquest as it, in, as it is in the present indictment. Now what he essentially does is he presents a plea of something called autre was acquit, which essentially means previously acquitted. And the trial continued the following day with much of the time trying to clearly establish the identity of the victim in relation to this naming. And the jury eventually concluded, we find that the child was as well known by the name of Charles William Beadle as any other name. In other words, to put it in layman's terms, uh, Sheen claimed double jeopardy. And it worked. The trial was dismissed and he was discharged. Now, as you can imagine, this wasn't a popular verdict. The evidence pointed to Sheen's guilt and the police didn't consider looking for anybody else. Moreover, this had been a ferocious murder. The Examiner newspaper devoted its front page to an outraged commentary on the trial and its outcome. It noted, a ball has been given in Rosemary Lane in honour of the law of England on the occasion of the acquittal of Sheen, who lately cut his child's head off. Whilst the examiner may have been slightly satirising these events in his local community of Rosemary Lane, the reality was unpalatable for at least some of his neighbours who took exception to Sheen's release. One of these was an elderly woman named Mary Roberts, who complained to the Lambeth Police Office that Sheen and his father had threatened her. Laying her complaint in front of the magistrate, she indignantly described William Sheen and his band of music, drums and fifes. He was marching about in his sleeves like any lord. As she said to the magistrate with some understatement, he's a bad boy, sir. Perhaps understandably, perhaps unsurprisingly, the extended Sheen family moved from the Rosemary Lane area after this and settled in Wentworth Street, about half a mile to the north, on the border between, between Spitalfields and Whitechapel. And we've just got a map here. Uh, this is East London, and this is the Wentworth Street just running all the way through. And here they ran a number of lodging houses and, as we'll see later, had considerable investment in the area. Over the, next couple of over the next couple of decades, the Sheen family continued to make regular incursions into the criminal justice system. Indeed, by 1840, the Morning Chronicle would refer to the family as the notorious Sheens. The murder and the events surrounding Sheen's prosecution and acquittal seem to have been the catalyst to launch the family's criminal career. Or perhaps more realistically, the murder brought unwelcome attention to, to their activities. In other words, we know about the Sheen's activities because they were the notorious Sheen's. So what did they get up to? Well, we've got, a, you know, there's a sort of litany of crimes. I won't talk through all of them. Sheen was charged with receiving stolen goods, appeared at the Old Bailey, not guilty. And Sheen gave evidence, and Sheen Sheen's mother at, the tr at a coining trial at the Old Bailey. He was charged, William was charged with drunkenness at Lambeth Street Magistrates Court, discharged. Members of the Sheen family gave evidence as informers in six trials at the Old Bailey across 1832. William Sheen gave evidence at the trial of Elizabeth Harwood for picking a pocket of a man in Anne Sheen, his mother's public house. She was found guilty and transported 
William Sheen was charged with threatening to kill his father, case dismissed. William Sheen was charged, charged with robbing one of his lodgers, case dismissed. Mary, William Sheen Sr., his father, threatened to uh, rip up the bowels of Mary Moore and their man. He was bound over to keep the peace. And again, William Sheen was witnessing in the case of an alleged theft from his lodging house. So these activities, which were captured by the official record, tell a story of a family fully enmeshed in criminal confederacy. And perhaps the most ex interesting aspect of this for a historian of crime is the nature of the family's relationship with the local police. The willingness of the Lambeth police to use members of the Sheen family as witnesses and informers reveals glimpses of the negotiation and interaction between police and their local communities in a way that's simply not recoverable on any larger scale. There's no legal impediment to using the Sheens as witnesses. Despite their many appearances in the courtrooms of the metropolis, they hadn't been found guilty of any felonies. So William had been acquitted of the crimes he was accused of. However, by 1837, Sheen's ability to operate relatively unimpeded came to an end. And perhaps not surprisingly, it wasn't the Lambeth police who pushed for a prosecution. Instead, it was a voluntary organisation called the London so Society for the Protection of Young Females and the Prevention of Juvenile Prostitution. So, in March 1837, the Times reported on the abduction of a Maria Egan. She was a 14-year-old girl, and she had been discovered at one of William Sheen's Wentworth Street lodging houses, or brothels. Maria claimed that she had been walking along Commercial Road with an old, when an old girl had started talking to her. They walked together for some distance and at length passed up Brick Lane and turned into Wentworth Street. This is a quote. They entered the house, number 77, and she was then immediately taken hold of by another girl, an inmate of the house, and forced into a room which was instantly locked. So she's abducted. And this apparently led to her being subjected to sexual encounters. She was rescued by her uncle, after which the family applied to the Society for the, Pretend for the Prevention of Juvenile Prostitution for advice and protection. And from this point, the Society worked fairly tirelessly with members of the local community and some of the local police in order to suppress Sheen's brothels. On the 2nd of June 1837, a party of Lambeth Street officers entered Sheen's house in the early hours of the morning and they found nine females and ten males lying indiscriminately and three, four and five in a bed who they took into custody along with Sheen himself. According to the evidence at the trial at the Middlesex Sessions, Sheen's, host, Sheen's house had been host to as many as 20 boys and 10 young girls under the age of 16. And this is a quote from the trial. The boys were encouraged in picking pockets and the wretched girls were made victims of the greatest depravity. Sheen was sentenced to 18 months imprisonment with hard labour. And the magistrate of Mr Pendergast, Prendergast pointed out that the Society for the Prevention of Juvenile Prostitution had most properly lent its aid to get rid of a nuisance of the most violent description. The role of the local police is more ambiguous. Certainly they were called upon to break open the brothels, but to what extent had it been the failure of the police to deal with Sheen that had led to local residents working with the society? The family's dominance of local territory meant that the police seemed to have been stymied in their ability to control the Sheens. As we've already seen, the evidence suggests that the family were aware of the law and were prepared to use the court system to protect their interests. Moreover, the earlier associations between the Sheen family and the police and the fact that Sheens were the Sheens were local property owners, however unsavoury, may also have been a factor. They've got, they have got money. Now, despite William having been finally put away, the Sheens continued to plague the authorities for another few years. And again, we've got a litany of offences over the late 30s and into the 40s. Um, and perhaps just the most important here are the uh, prosecution of Anne Sheen in 1840. She was charged with receiving stolen goods, found guilty and sentenced to transportation. But she was actually, uh, had her sentence mitigated and she was imprisoned in Millbank 
uh, due to her age, which was 59, which was quite advanced at the time. And we've got several other charges. Um, in May 1845, this is important as well, Sheen was charged with threatening a pub landlord, Conrad Bueller, with a knife, and he was bound over to keep the peace. And then finally, in 1847, he was charged with violently beating his common-law wife, Mary Ann Sullivan, and he was found guilty of aggravated assault and sent to prison for 12 months. So what had happened in this period? Sheen had been released from Clerkenwell Prison in early 1839, and he actually manages to keep his head down and keep relatively quiet for a couple of years. But then obviously in 1842, something changes. What had changed was the death of his mother. So Anne Sheen, Anne Sheen's death in 1842 would be the catalyst for increasingly violent behaviour from her son. Her time in prison had taken its toll, and in October 1842, her health had failed. The report of her death in the Times noted that Mrs Sheen's considerable property, which consisted of bank stock and houses, had been signed over to her favourite son, Bill, to secure it from the grasp of the sheriff in the case of a conviction. Sheen's drunken and disorderly behaviour during the funeral of his mother was reported in the Examiner and in the Morning Chronicle. Anne's funeral procession had taken her body to a private burial ground in Church Lane, Whitechapel. Conrad Bueller, remember him, the landlord of the City of Norwich Public House and also the executor of Anne's will, described how Sheen had conducted himself more like a madman than anything else. His manner in the burial ground was excessively violent. He thumped the coffin, he gave his wife a black eye when she tried to restrain him. Another witness, Samuel Taylor, stated that Sheen had been shouting throughout the procession, despite the fact that he was actually a chief mourner. And other witnesses described Sheen drunkenly exclaiming that he was Bill Sheen, what murdered his child. Events deteriorated when the family returned home for the reading of the will, and Sheen found that his mother's property had been left to his two younger brothers. <coughs> he destroyed the will, then threatened Taylor with a knife, he was finally taken into custody, exclaiming, I'm Bill Sheen, the murderer, but Clarkson got me out of it, in spite of all the bloody laws in the country. Not surprisingly, at the hearing that followed, Sheen had absolutely no recollection of his behaviour, and the magistrate bound him over. And Sheen's violence and drunkenness escalated over the following years, leading to his eventual imprisonment for the assault of his wife, Mary Ann, in 1847. At this point, he finally almost disappears from the record. In 1851, his death was registered in the last quarter of the year, aged about 51. So, 19th of December. And it was reported nationally, and it was reported across various newspapers. For example, the era reported in capital letters, the end of Sheen, the infanticide. Reports were also printed in the Examiner, the Hampshire Telegraph, the Sussex Chronicle, the Manchester Times, the Preston Guardian, the Northern Star, and so on. And most of the newspapers record details of the 1827 murder, and most commented on his notoriety. To quote, the life so spared, however, has since been a most miserable one. So what evidence do we have that some of the fragments of Sheen's life may have stirred the literary imagination of one of his, one of his metropolitan contemporaries? Whilst traditionally comparisons have been drawn between Fagin and the real-life Jewish fence Ike Solomons, who was transported in 1830, these similarities were superficial. We've got uh, the David Lean's uh, Alec Guinness's uh, evocation of uh, rather anti-Semite evocation of Fagin uh, on the left, and this is Ike Solomon's here. In making Fagin a Jew, Dickens was drawing on stereotypes which were common in the period. As Dickens himself reflected in later life, it unfortunately was true of the time to which that story refers, that that class of criminal almost invariably was a Jew. So how likely is it that Fagin was actually really Welsh? Moreover, whilst I've called this paper the real Fagin, 
it probably hasn't escaped your notice that Sheen also does a reasonable impersonation of the violent burglar Bill Sykes. It's certainly unlikely that Dickens would have been unaware of William Sheen. In the years between 1825 and 1829, when Sheen was first making his name in the dock of the Old Bailey, the young Charles Dickens was shaping his interest in current affairs of the criminal justice system, working for a, paper, a London paper called the British Press, providing notices of accidents, fires and police reports. He was also freelance reporting at Doctors' Commons and clerking for two lawyers, so he was closely involved with legal London. From 1831, a period in which the notorious Sheens would regularly appear in the London press, Charles Dickens was expanding his journalism into the realm of parliamentary reporting, writing first for the Mirror of Parliament and then the True Sun from March 1832, and finally moving to the Morning Chronicle in 1834. Whilst it was at the Morning Chronicle that Dickens first literary work, that Dickens' literary work first started to be recognised for much of the period up until the autumn of 1836 when he resigned as a reporter, his parliamentary writing continued. So he continues his close connection to Parliament. And it was during this same period that the reporting of William Sheen expanded into the parliamentary arena via the investigations of William Augustus Miles. So remember that connection between Miles and Edwin Chadwick, and it's actually for Chadwick's report into policing and poverty that uh, Miles actually gives evidence at Parliamentary, Parliamentary Select Committee about these investigations. Dickens was still writing for the Morning Chronicle in November 1835, when one anonymous wit commented in the paper, and this is eight years after the murder, if Sheen had set up an infant school, we question whether any parents would put their, their offspring under his hands. However sin sincerely he may have convinced himself that all things considered, the sentiment of society, the prejudices of the world, the set of public opinion, it was better to leave children's heads on their shoulders, even when they cried or refused to do what they were bid. By the autumn of 1836, Dickens may have been planning Oliver Trist, although according to his biographer Burton Wheeler, the first chapters were not, not completed before January 1837, and the initial Parish Boys Progress was started as a short serial in Bentley's Miscellany in February 1837. Fagin and his Field Lane Nursery of Crime were introduced in the May instalment. Sheen was Welsh, probably having lived in London since his late teens, could Dickens have fought a Jewish Fagin more topical than a Welsh Fagin? Sheen didn't live in Field Lane, which had a notorious reputation for criminality and would have been well known to Dickens, but he did live in Whitechapel, the location to which young Oliver would be conveyed after being recaptured by Sykes and Nancy. Indeed, the fictional Sykes lived nearby in Bethnal Green. In June 1837, after introducing Fagin and the Artful Dodger, Dickens broke from writing due to the death of his young sister-in-law, Mary Hogarth. In July 1837, he introduced Nancy, the young prostitute, as she accuses Fagin in a later chapter, I feed for you when I was a child not, not half as old as this. In shifting his focus to the story of Nancy, had Dickens been introduced by events earlier in the year when the Times had reported on the abduction of Maria Egan from Sheen's Wentworth Street brothel, the raids on Sheen's house, and his prosecution at Middlesex Quarter Sessions had taken place that June. Sheen's career as a public criminal was undoubtedly known about and written, in the press, in the, written about in the spheres in which Dickens moved, Parliament, journalism, criminal justice and the philanthropic se sector. Ultimately, we can only ever speculate about the extent to which the composite elements of Sheen's life were a contemporary source for Dickens' characterisation of Fagin and the bully Sykes. However, a telling reference is found in the Morning Chronicle in September 1842. Sheen had appeared at Worship Street Court to answer a charge from an unfortunate girl called Anne Raven. And Raven claimed to have been assaulted on Sheen's orders. The evidence was weak and he was eventually discharged, just for a change. 
but a moment described in the press account provides a, a really chilling echo, I think, of Dickens' characters. So Raven describes being beaten up by these two women, one of whom cohabited with Sheen. The, the prisoner encouraged their violence by clapping his hands and calling out, Caesar, my bulldogs, go it again, with similar exclamations. I don't think that's just that picture of sort of Sheen standing there encouraging these women to their violence. It's, it's, it very much provides those echoes. So to finish, I'd like to say a little bit about how this work fits into my broader perspective as a historian of crime and justice. So the history I've presented today is very much in the style of a micro-history. And according to the historian Peter Burke, micro-history should aim to demonstrate the links between small communities and macro-historical trends. So in telling Sheen's story, it could be argued, I'm offending on the focusing career of an extraordinary criminal who has very little in common with the vast swathe of ordinary people who travelled through the Victorian justice system, criminal justice system. On the other hand, Sheen's story provides us with a close lens to examine situations, activities and relationships which help us to understand larger historical developments, such as the impact of the new police and the role of police in local communities, the changing nature of the prosecution process and of practices such as informing the development of welfare and rescue groups, particularly in relation to prostitution, and finally the connections between print culture and criminal lives, which has been a key focus of the paper. And this brings me to a final point. So you may be wondering about the ethics of letting a thorough villain like Sheen have a voice. Yet while Sheen may have few, if, redeem, if, if any, redeeming features, he remains part of that community of East London. And clearly this was a community in conflict when it came to the Sheen family. Nevertheless, they were inhabitants in the Wentworth Street area for a couple of decades. Sheen was far from an isolated figure. As well as his parents, he had siblings in the area. A relative, Samuel Sheen, ran the private burial ground in which both Anne and William were buried. The Sheen's owned property and have had active connections to other members of the community, including publicans, and policemen, as well as their neighbours. Moreover, Sheen was a father himself, and the evidence suggests that at least some of his family and descendants remain in the area. So whilst he may have been a bad man, this detective work into the life of Sheen and his family enables a glimpse into early Victorian London that would be impossible if considering any of these events in isolation. Moreover, whilst we often see the characters in Dickens' books as caricatures, by telling Sheen's story, we see that they may not have been simply creatures of his imagination. Thank you. OK, that was great, Heather. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Well, the technicality was on the drawing of the indictment. It was actually the, the misnames. It is quite confusing, it has to be said, actually. And, and the really shocking thing is how little coverage there actually was of this. I mean, if you imagine it, if you put it in the context of today's press, the sort of headlines you would get. So it is, the indictment has to be absolutely precise in terms of how it details the defendant, the charge, and the victim, and, and even things like addresses. Otherwise, it means that you can be done for sort of like, the, 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 the case can be dismissed. So this <laughs> is when they come back, they actually try, they, they actually submit several indictments at the second trial. I think they write 17 versions, because <laughs> they're so worried that um, what, ha what does happen will actually happen. And it does seem absolutely incredible that they know that he actually they know that he did this, but he, he actually um, did get off on this technicality. And a fascinating thing is, in the hist is that if you look at sort of legal history books, and I don't so much mean sort of the sort of history I do or colleagues do, more the actual training, the, the, the manuals that lawyers get, the case is actually cited in there quite frequently as being sort of, you know, of the, the sort of what could actually technically happen with indictments. <laughs>
So it's just to do with the surname of the Yes, victim. the fact that just yeah. the, and to do with the illegitimacy. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I don't think it was particularly, but I don't think you, because I think murder in many ways is a constant. There's a certain, you know, it's one of those crimes in terms of it's the sort of like number of murders committed is often seen as relatively com not so subject to external factors. Having said that, I don't know how to say, what I would say is that child, children simply were not treasured quite in the same way today, so violence against children. Whilst clearly it's still frowned on, it's, life is, was, was certainly shorter and much more fra fragile and much more brutal, I think, for people in this class. They, they have got property, but they, they occupy this slightly liminal space, I think, in terms of their class, you know. Where do they sit? Yes, they're working class and they're perceived essentially as being, you know, a rough family, yet they, you know, Anne Sheen has a, leaves a will, which is unusual. She leaves property. So they're, they're in a funny sort of area. But undoubtedly, you know, a period in which children die even though child mortality is, you know, it's not as, it's not as bad as it was, a, a period in which children die very frequently, I guess that something like murder, child murder, hasn't quite got the same, uh, you know, it doesn't quite evoke the same horror as it would today. Yeah. Yeah highly transient population. Often throughout the 18th and 19th century, lots of populations, when you have periods of slum clearance, lots of populations pushed out from the centre of London out to the East End. Lots of communities coming in, both internally from the rest of the country, i.e. we have you know, this Welsh community within the East End, as well as later in the 19th century, you have the Jewish community coming in, and so on. So it's a... It's, it, it's a I think it's unfair, you know, it gets characterised as being this horrendous slum and clearly it is a mixed area and people do work in that area but um, there is a high level, I think, of transient population and, and poor housing as well, lots of sort of housing that are divided up into lots of, um, you know, subletting flats and that and which are very old houses uh, by the early 19th century which are starting to, to sort of fall apart. So it, it's, it's got all those sorts of um, ingredients, I think, to put it under pressure. And, and I think, yeah, the, the proximity to the docks is important as well. How long do you think it takes for a community, an incoming community, to develop the sort of um, moral structure in its own? I don't know if I can answer that, really. I'm not sure. Um, what do you mean, in what sense? Well, I mean, it seems to me that this is I'm not sure. I think the thing is, though, that, that, you know, the, the East End had always had communities coming in. It's always been a community in flux. It's always been sort of, you know, it's got that long history, hasn't it? Because in the 17th century, you had the Huguenots coming in, you know, then you get the Jews and so on. There's a German community in the East End. There's an Italian, Anglo-Italian community in the 19th century, this is. So I'm not... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't even know if they perceive themselves as being if they've got a strong Welsh identity. I mean, is there anybody from Wales here? No. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. What I do know about Radnorshire, which I think it's historic, isn't it? It's not there now. Is that it had? It's a very rural county on the border. Is it Hertfordshire? Her I'm not Hertfordshire. Hereffordshire. And it had quite a lot of economic decline in the late 18th, early 19th century. So from what I know, there was quite an exodus from that sort of part of Wales to London for work. Whenever they came and saw themselves as a specifically Welsh community, it's hard to tell. There is a Baptist chapel, so there's various little sort of non-conformist chapels which perhaps conform to sort of Welsh religious identity. I don't know, but it's... Yeah. You, <laughs> yeah, so it's, and I can't trace Sheen's birth, frustrating as it is, you know, it's pre-civil registration, obviously. I've got his death, I've got his death certificate, um, you know, in, 
Yeah, his death certificate. That's really sad, isn't it? It's really sad that I've got his death certificate. I've just realised. I've got Anne Sheen's as well. Um, but, you know, I, I know that he's born around the turn of the century, and that's all I know, but I've not been able to trace it. He's just a violent, you know, he's a violent man in a violent time. Um, it has to be said, my impression is all his crimes, that he was up completely off his face, to put it colloquially. This, that, the biggest factor here is alcohol. There's a f great, great anecdote, well, it's a case, where he goes off drinking with a friend, and he's so drunk he can't walk, so his friend has to carry him home over his shoulder. The next thing is a crowd start following them, and this is in the period of burking, you know, of body snatching, and they think that this chap who's sh carrying Sheen, they actually think Sheen's a dead body, and so this chap is actually burking him, and it ends up at court, and of course Sheen's sort of saying, I'm terribly sorry, Your Honour, not quite as politely as that, but I was drunk, you know, and sort of, it just, oh, it, <sighs> I always have to sort of like, I always sound slightly fond of Sheen, which I'm slightly, which I'm, you know, he is awful and it's that awful thing of historical dis distance. But um, he is somebody whose voice comes through, you know, and he's, that is my overriding impression of him. He's a drunk. And in fact, he dies, like I said, you know, he's, he's dead by 51, which, okay, the longevity, that period, and Sheen's dead by 60. But um, he's dead after quite a lot of illness as well. So I'm sort of assuming that he may have drunk himself to death, really. Matthew. Uh, yeah, just on the Welshness of the East End, I know that the building which is now the Marks Memorial Library, which is Royal Aldwych, uh, has its origins in the school for the Welsh community. Oh, which really? Is associated with the annual or biannual big cattle drives. The to the oh, that's interesting. And, uh, from that kind of community grew up. Ah, that's interesting. That's something I didn't know. I know there are, like I say, there's definitely sort of like signs of the Welsh community behind the Sheens there. But I did wonder what actually drove them there, otherwise than those, you know, other than those economic things I was talking about. But that could, yeah, that's interesting. Yes. Uh, I know you explained that the evidence is difficult in the end, but if I was to would you think that um, Dickens definitely drew on Sheen for his thinking character? I think it's difficult, isn't it? Because everything's a composite um, to some extent with these things. The interesting thing is, up till uh, for a long time, everybody was pretty sure that Sol uh, you know Fagin was based on Solomon's. But if you look at Solomon's, the only co the only similarity to Dickens, really, I mean to Fagin, sorry, is that he's Jewish. You know, it's the wrong period. Uh, I think there is, you know, he is involved in some sort of receiving, but he does actually get his fame from a rather complicated, um, if, well, I'm not sure, it's, it's confusing. He gets transported, but then he has to come back and the foreign artist gets involved and it comes a bit of a cause celebre. And so this is, he just becomes known as this sort of Jewish criminal. Um, but actually, John Forster, who was Dickens' very close friend, uh, wrote about this, and I think he actually said that he just thought it was, you know, current, it, it was just the Jewishness that, sh that uh, I was going to say Shane then, which, uh, sorry, as a colleague of ours, that uh, he thought that uh, Dickens had just dr dr drawn on that sort of stereotype. I sort of think that the coincidence of where uh, the, the sort of work that Dickens is doing, and particularly the, the events around the sort of abduction, the, the sort of um, the investigations into the um, Sheen's brothel or lodging houses and taking the children out of there, and, and the sort of descriptions which were in the parliamentary domain of the boys practicing picking the pocket of um, Sheen. I think those are the most sort of similar. Uh, it, it's difficult. I mean, I'm not a writer. I'm not, you know, when you create characters, how does that work? One assumes that you take elements of things that you see around you. Um, I mean, there's been a book fairly recently came out by the historian uh, Ruth Richardson who talked about the fact that um, the that in his early life, Dickens lived near a workhouse, which was the model for the workhouse in Oliver Trist. And there just happened to be a chap who I think was something like, I don't know, a butcher or a cobbler or something, who was called Bill Sykes. And everything, I, I read all this press around that saying, we finally know who Bill Sykes is, but he just obviously borrowed the name. 
uh, just as he borrowed the name Fagin from a boy he used to work with at Warren's Blacking Factory. Whereas I think sort of like Sheen, there's enough in here and they were so, they were so well publicised at the time, there was so much press about them. I think, um, I think it's, you know, there's enough there to sort of convince me that he certainly takes elements of that. But that's as far, you know, it is speculation at the end of the day. Yeah, it's an interesting one there, the sort of deviance amplification argument almost. I think he does sort of like, he swings between that, that thing at the Anshin's funeral where he's clearly sort of drunkenly shouting about, you know, you know who I am, I'm Bill Sheen. And there's a couple of other things where he sort of talks about that, I'm Bill Sheen. Often he says things like, they never leave me alone. This is one of his complaints. He said, oh, there's a great thing. And like, you think, well, yeah, you did actually murder your child, you know. But he sort of says, oh, they've been, everyone's been going on at me ever since that thing back in those years ago, and I've never been left alone. Nobody can leave me to, you know, but he sort of protests a bit too much. So I think to some extent there is a, an element of that. Um, I mean, the other thing is, and it's, uh, you, I'm never going to know this, but, you know, he may have been quite a frightening man. I mean, that's the sort of Sykes characterizations. This is a violent, uh, quite brutal man. And perhaps he does use that, that sort of power it might have actually gave him. Um, you can't imagine today, I think, if somebody had, known he c had committed a murder where the evidence all suggests it was, it was absolutely them and they went back to live in that community. I just can't imagine how that had actually worked. You can't imagine that they'd actually survive. Whereas Sheen has this power and whilst there's some neighbours that are clearly uncomfortable with it and there are complaints from other neighbours as well, um, there's other neighbours who are out partying with him when they come out and have the sort of celebrations after his release. So I think he does play up to it to a certain extent, and that's not unprecedented in crime history. You know, you can look at the sort of classic accounts of highway robbers in the 18th century and that whole idea of sort of highway robbers really sort of enjoying this sort of status they get through their public notoriety. So yes, I think it's, the papers love being shocked by Sheen. It says things like, Sheen again. You know, and it sort of it, it does sort of like have this sort of tone when they write about him. But I think there's a sort of two way relationship. Yes, you can in the red section. What um, you said that his second his common law wife is the one he got convicted for the assault. What happened to the mother? Lydia, yeah, I don't know. Right. I think she left him. Right. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps perhaps not surprisingly, but I was and also the the marriages, it's, they married pre-marriage certificate anyway, and the marriages, you know, it's not as... So I'd have to find it in a parish register. I can't find any divorce papers. I assume that they didn't get divorced in this period. It's far too early for the people of that sort of class. Um, and his wife afterwards, and I think there may be more than one, um, are described as common law. She's with him for quite a long time, and apparently, you know, that, at the point where he assaults her, she ends up hospitalised. Um, but apparently she's had years and years of beating. So, but yeah, I think Lydia just disappears. Hopefully she goes and meets somebody nicer. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Did you, Hello. sorry, was, was there one more? Yeah. Sorry. No, it's the same question. No, okay. Um, well, thanks everyone, everyone for coming. Um, you should receive an invite to the next talk in your inboxes very soon. Um, and could you join me in thanking Heather one more time? Thank you.